introduce Jack Skinner, who's doing a talk pushing the web to the next level. Jack is a senior software engineer turned API evangelist at MYB. So I could please get a round of applause for Jack. Thank you. Awesome, and we're going to get... Sweet. So thank you very much. I, I am indeed Jack Skinner. Some of you may also know me by my lanyards, which often turn out to be this. Um, great fun with that one. Um, but if you'd like to tweet me throughout the afternoon, um, embarrassing photos are always fun to go back to, including questions. Um, you can find me here at Developer Jack. Uh, and while I'm on that topic, if you use this um, particular hashtag, I'll go back, I'll find your question, uh, and I'll see if I can answer it. So if we don't get to questions afterwards, or you've got something after um, the talk that you'd like to sort of find me, I'll keep an eye on this for about a day, and you're more than welcome to, um, to ask those sort of offline. If you use both the nzjsconf hash, uh, con hashtag as well, uh, it also means that your question will be shorter and hopefully an easier to answer. Cool. Why am I going to talk to you about HTTP2? Um, for me, the biggest benefit is performance, and so I'm going to dive into this afternoon's talk um, laying the groundwork for why we should all care about performance before we dive into the hows and whens. Um, a one second simulated speed difference resulted in a 4.9% reduction in the articles read in the Financial Times. Think about a, a, an almost 5% reduction in your content consumption on your site simply because of one second. 30% of sales are on uh, are mobile, and the average mobile site loads in just under seven seconds. And yet 40% of your customers leave in almost half that time. 40%. So simply by um, reneging on your performance, you're going to lose customers. Now, th these particular sales figures are from the US, um, but they are particularly pertinent to local markets, markets as well. Um, Amazon famously reported this, I think it was in 96. It was still quoted on stage at Google I.O. last year. Um, about a 1% improvement to their results had a 1%, uh, 100 milliseconds was 1% revenue. Um, this has been reported both ways, so 100 milliseconds lost for 1% revenue lost. Um, but it is still a phenomenal um, amount of cash in the bank that you don't have from 100 milliseconds. Uh, GQ relaunched this site about 18 months ago in the middle of 2015, and they found that an 80% reduction in load time had an 80% increase in traffic. Uh, f furthermore, they had um, they'd gone from about 5.9 minutes on site um, up to 7.8. Now, uh, who, who works a little bit more in the sort of um, server management DevOpsy space? Cool. They reduced the number of calls to server by 400%. And they managed to get their site down to uh, under two seconds for that page load. 79% of dissatisfied customers will not purchase from the same site again, and a further 44% will actively tell their friends. That's almost half. And now particularly relevant for me is, is Aussie internet speeds pales in comparison to the US. Um, and that divide is um, 10 times worse in many parts of the world. So localize your own performance metrics and your benchmarks um, to compare to where your customers are experiencing your site. But most importantly, um, slow sites make me sad. I do a lot of travel. I do a lot of um, mobile browsing. And every single time I have a slow, sluggish experience, it grinds on me. So we're going to dive into some of the performance uh, strategies and benefits for HTTP2 and how you can take advantage of it. Um, now, a quick show of hands. I'm a bit of an interactive speaker. How many people here know HTTP 1.1 really well? Oh, come on. Cool. So we're all going to go and write an HTTP implementation this afternoon, right? So a very, very quick recap. Um, it's a question and answer, request and response. We get some metadata and some content, and we, we either push it to the server or we get back a response. That's, a, that's how the web works in questions and answers. And so the, the, the easiest thing is, well, you ask the cloud a question, the cloud answers back, right? And when the cloud is slow, you move the cloud slightly closer to your client. That is essentially what a CDN does, is it moves the cloud closer. Now, it, it also helps to abstract a couple of complexities in your stack, and there's a lot of extra work that a CDN does, but it's often the first thing 
that you'll contemplate when you're thinking, ah, oh, how do I speed up my site? Another strategy we'll use is minification. So we'll take a particularly large and chunky script and we'll you know, minify it and give it a substantially longer file name for some reason. And then, of course, we'll take that and we'll gzip it um, in transport. So it's the smallest possible file we can send. And, of course, that comes down from the cloud. Um, who here has some kind of build pipeline to manage all their front-end assets? You're doing much better than I do because you're putting script.js and dependencies.js and libs.js into everything.js and then you shove that down the wire. Or if you're really good, you get it down to everything.min.js and then you shove that down the wire. And that's really good at the moment because browsers want to be lazy. They don't necessarily want to handle all of these open connections. That's one of the biggest performance bottlenecks that our current browsers and connections have today. And caching, taking advantage of that particular file already being on the client's browser, is really important. So what's changing? Uh, well, I'm not going to dive into all of the nitty-gritty details of H2. Um, the quick summary is that it's binary. It's, it's not just a, a telnet and a couple of uh, ASCII characters anymore. Uh, it does introduce multiplexing, which I'll discuss a little bit later. And there's a couple of other features around compression, um, uh, prioritizing communications, and things like that that we will eventually address when we deep dive. Um, but for today, I want to stay fairly high level and, and things you can take away. The internet, for me, is, is much like a tap. Because when you ask for your water or your, your web page, it doesn't come immediately out. It's a little bit like this, where you eventually get the water, but it's got to come out of the tank and up the path and around the bend and then up the hill and you sort of see the gurgling noise and then there's a bit of a bottleneck somewhere, so you, you kick the pipe and suddenly your web page spits out into the browser. That's a really horrible, horrible experience. Waiting is one of the biggest bottlenecks we have today. And you'll notice it's got nothing to do with the server or the client. It's simply that communication. And so if we dive into some of the metrics we look at, we look at time to first byte. How long does it take me to actually get that content coming down to my browser? And that is one of the big metrics that um, CDNs will help boast, is you know, their time to get that content from their servers to yours is going to be faster, uh, to, to your clients, is going to be faster, simply because it's closer. Now, I'm a, a huge security advocate. I love to encrypt all the things which means I also like to add a TLS overhead to all of my connections from my browser to my server, um, which is important and arguably neg negligible. But every single time I say this, I have one person that comes up and goes, oh, but TLS is slow. I'm not going to do it. It's got a performance um, hit. I'm not going to do TLS. Well, let's revisit that for a second, because if we introduce HTTP 2, which requires t uh, TLS in the browser, we end up only having to do one handshake, and then can communicate multiple times. And that's because HTTP2 does multiplexing. So what used to be a single connection is still a single connection, but you can have multiple request and response pairs down that pipe. We call them streams. And so what you traditionally thought of as requests can now be thought of as streams over the same connection. And that's really important, especially when you're doing this. Because today, with HTTP2, combining your assets into one huge, monolithic, completely undebuggable, horrible everything.js is a bit of an anti-pattern. And the reason for that is you can't take advantage of browser caching um, as effectively with a large file as you can with a small one. Uh, say, for example, um, you've got a dependency, and you've got a build pipeline, and you, you shove everything into one file, and all of a sudden your dependency goes offline. Uh, let's call it write pad. And you know you can build that in a couple of lines of code and, and fix up your implementation, but then you've got to download a new version of everything.js to all of your tens of thousands of customers. That's huge. And so if you keep your dependencies in um, perhaps still pipeline sort of blocks of code, but, but continue using multiple assets, you start to harness the caching benefits that a browser gives you without the connection overhead. Now, one of my favorite features in HTTP2 is, of course, server push. The server can proactively send assets down the pipe. And no, this is not WebSockets. 
So a server is now also responsible for its client's performance. It can avoid those round trips if it knows what you're going to ask. It's kind of like that mate that comes up to you and goes, can I ask you a favor? And you kind of know they're always going to ask for two or three more after that. That's exactly how web pages load today. Can I have index.html? No, 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 that's all I want right now. Well, I'll probably ask you for style.css in a minute, and so on and so forth. So a server can now proactively shove that down the pipe, um, multiple levels. I'm not a designer, so I, I figured I, I may as well go with Comic Sans. And it's this type of communication that is changing the way we need to design and think about how we build our components, our pages, our applications. Because yesterday's best practices are becoming today's anti-patterns. Not all of them. Minification, you know, reducing the amount of data you need to transport is always important. But how you leverage caching, how you leverage the transport, how you're actually getting that first render time to the browser is completely different. And for me, it helps bring together all parts of the stack in one solid conversation. There's no longer just, oh, we build the API and we build the front end, and then a big round table where everyone goes, oh, no, it's your application that's not doing this right. Oh, no, because your, your API is slow. No, we actually have to talk about these things now so we understand the conversation that's happening. Um, I'm an API evangelist. I, I think about APIs all the time. And whenever I see a mobile app like this, I think, ah, those are different things. Categories, apps, different assets and resources that we should be representing programmatically in a very different and unique way are being munged together into one big, chunky API response simply because it used to optimize that single TCP connection in HTTP 1. Well, now, conceptually, I can get the mobile endpoint and push down what needs to be in that. We can actually have a conversation about what data you need now, what data you need later, if you even need categories at all. You don't have to lump everything up and just, you know what, it's only half a K. We'll just shove that down the pipe. And if they need it later, then everything's good, right? Yeah, not so much. So what are we doing about it? What can we actually do today when you leave this talk, what can you do? Well, 79% of browsers currently support HTTP2. OK, it's about 74 for full compatibility. A further 5 to 6% has partial compatibility. And by partial, I mean it's, it's spec compliant. But when the spec says a server may push an asset, Safari probably won't listen. And it's really easy to enable. So if you want to go and take advantage of multiplexing, um, without any of the complicated conversational stuff, just simply collapse all those connections and those requests into one. Um, it's quite easy. I, I use CloudFront for my blog. And there it is. It took about 20 seconds to find it, three seconds to save it, and 15 minutes to propagate across all the endpoints. And then I was running on HTTP2. In fact, I did this particular update approximately 20 minutes before walking on stage at Kiwi PyCon. And it worked. So I can actually update to HTTP2 live without stressing about the uptime for my site and know that clients are going to accept, communicate, work with me on that protocol. Because HTTP2 is backwards compatible. It's essentially an upgrade request from H1. Hey there, do you speak HTTP2? Awesome, let's speak HTTP2. And that's your communication upgrade. And I could see it straight away. Uh, now, I've, I've picked two different assets here because they visually represent the difference um, quite dramatically. You can see here that the, the biggest wait time is that time to first byte. Literally just waiting for data to start rumbling down the pipe and hit my browser. When I enabled HTTP2, that wait time was significantly smaller. Almost non-existent. And in fact, the biggest wait time was DNS. Um, how many people here are actively using web components or Polymer or Anything like that? A couple of hands up around the extremities of the room. Um, the crux of it is you build modular, reusable components across your web page. You know, that submit button from MailChimp is a, is a component. And the reason I'm sharing with you this is because there's a startup, um, Simpler, who are in many ways trying to get rid of the CMS. And they're building your web page as lots of reusable components, each of which store their own data, 
manage their own editing and rendering, and then store it up to an, uh, the simpler API. So you no longer log into the CMS. You literally go to your site. It knows you're logged in. Click Edit. Ah, oh, inline editing. Awesome. We've been wanting that for years on the web. And when they rolled out with HTTP2, they found that their performance was about 400% faster. Now, they ran this benchmark for about 500 page elements. So you can think about 500 API calls having to go back and forth. And that's huge, because we are limited in the number of TCP connections that a single um, browser can have open to a particular host at any one point in time. Um, they ran some benchmarks for me, because uh, I didn't have access to their stack. And they said that um, at HTTP 1, they were looking at about 42 seconds of page load. That's well beyond having lost customers. When they enabled HTTP 2 without a CDN, simply to their origin, they had that down to 15 seconds. And by moving that content significantly closer to their customers via a CDN, they got down to nine seconds. Now, nine seconds is by no means an excellent page load time. But considering that you are rendering 500 elements on page with dependencies on network traffic, that's quite an achievement on HTTP 1. And they then ramped this up as a test. And so what we're looking at here is that the, um, the red line is the performance of HTTP 1. And the blue line is the performance of HTTP 2. Now, this was a local benchmark, so we didn't have a lot of um, uh, rep repetition on this. Um, so there's a couple of anomalies there that you'll see early on. But what we can see here is that as the number of requests grow, HTTP scales much more elegantly with those streams. Really, HTTP 2 is a new way for us to think about that communication. Um, it challenges us in how we structure our API design whether or not we do bring all those resources in together. And we are still only just scratching the surface. I mean, a lot of this is, is theory and a little bit of, of testing, right? So what are you going to take away today? Well, the first thing is links. A lot of the middleman services, so your proxies, your CDNs, um, Apache does it fairly well, um, allow you to hint towards a push. And what they'll do is they'll interpret a preload link and proactively reproduce a get back to your origin and then serve that up over the one HTTP2 connection to the client. So the client is going to get a couple of pushed assets, but your application is going to see that as an inbound HTTP, uh, HTML request, and then with the same headers, the style.css, and then the script.js, um, quite simply like this. Now, I structured this as an API because I did a bit of a thought experiment, and I've started to rebuild um, uh, an API that's up online called the Star Wars API. And what it would look like is HTTP 2. So say you've got a resource online, any, any kind of recess, resource. Let's, let's call this films. And in, in a film, it's going to push down some of the characters that are in that film. So let's, let's pop up a character. Now, of course, a character may appear in many films. And because our requests are idempotent, we're going to push down a couple of other films. And of course, those films have other characters, which actually flew on multiple starships, which appeared in the original film. Link headers can get dangerous, especially for HTTP 1 clients. So for that 20, 30, 20 to 30% of your client base that does not necessarily upgrade to HTTP 2, they'll be receiving that link header as an H1 client. And their browser will be doing that request, even if they don't need it. So by the server trying to be smart and proactively hint towards a push, you can risk a performance degradation on your client. I mean, that kind of led me to, to this hacky implementation as a bit of an experiment, so a bit of a recursion countdown. So I, I want to push two levels of my graph, which, of course, loads up the people, decrements, and then pushes out another film, and we hit zero. And this is just one of the experiments that I've started to look into. Um, I'll publish some of the data a little bit later on blog posts. I don't want to dive too deeply into that. I want to put this up as an example of thinking about the way that your server communicates with both H1 and H2 clients. Use link headers responsibly. And in fact, use push responsibly. Um, there's a fantastic example coming out of some of the um, Google Chrome team uh, with the Polymer uh, work that they're doing. Uh, and their advice was PRPL, push, render, preload, and then lazy load. And it's a great way to think about users interacting with your app. First of all, you need to push down what they need. Then what do they need for rendering? Right, so maybe the styles uh, shortly after that, maybe some images. Now, once a client has that, you can preload their next action. 
probably going to be a menu item somewhere, maybe below the fold. Depends on your application and your content. And then eventually, you can lazy load the rest of the app. And this moves towards some of their progressive web apps and, and taking a uh, web experience offline. But thinking about how your user interacts with your service and your application and how you can harness HTTP2 server push and other elements around that is going to be the biggest performance driver for you and your customers. All right, so we're at a tech conference. What about some code? Um, really simple package, eloquently named, subtle. Um, and instead of diving into um, what has been many hours of coding and poking and prodding and seeing how HTTP2 squirms, I want to show you this little snippet. Now, it's difficult, and I, I hate putting code up on slides. Can you see that OK at the back? I'm, I'm seeing some nodding. OK, I'm going to assume yes. If not, have a chat to me afterwards. Um, this snippet of code is how you would push a resource, presumably having already responded with, say, index.html. First of all, we take the response and we create a new push object. Um, the way HTTP2, this HTTP2 library um, does it internally is it creates a new um, uh, outbound response object, which mirrors a response. Um, in that, we are telling it that essentially this is a push based on a get of this URL with these headers. Generally speaking, that will be the same inbound headers as your original request. And then all you need to do is tell it the response code that you're pushing, write the data out, and end that stream. And the library does it for you, which is kind of cool. It's a small amount of code, and it's going to vary on every single framework that you're using. I'm not going to say you can just roll this out overnight. But what is a couple of lines of code in a library that has HTTP2 support means you could maybe foot in the door just experiment with what the performance benefit could be pushing out your one most requested resource, potentially. How are you going to approach this? How, how do you currently approach performance? I have a 3M strategy. In fact, it's the only way that I know to do performance um, improvements. Um, the first step is to measure it. After all, you can't measure, what, you can't improve what you don't measure. Um, the second step is to measure it again once you've made a change. Um, and it will be um, utterly hilarious for you to find out that the third M also happens to be measure, because you need to keep these performance benchmarks in mind as you improve your application, because client environments are also constantly changing. If you're sitting on the server side of a, a communication or an app or an API, your client's ecosystem is constantly changing. And so you need to monitor and, and, and track that for how your customers are adopting new browsers that will support HTTP2. Um, there's some work going into Google Chrome at the moment around um, uh, cross-origin um, resources and uh, service worker. You need to know how your client's browsers are going to let you adopt that type, type of technology for your APIs. Um, ultimately, with every change you do make with your application, and especially with HTTP2, measure your client's um, performance benefit. And if that's actually one thing you take away, is to be the performance benefit you want to experience on the web. I can bitch and moan about, ah, slow sites make me sad. But think about your experience. If you're doing internet banking and it's slow and sluggish, it's a horrible experience for you. What about all of your customers? And then think, if all of those customers are having that experience, how many am I losing? How much revenue have I lost on this? And then revisit why you're doing performance in the first place. Find that reason and measure it so that you can go back and actually plan for time to improve performance, time to clean up that dead weight. But try something new. And I, I leave all of my HTTP content with this slide because I want to challenge you to go out there and experiment a little bit with HTTP2. I mean, we, we can present up here and we can read blogs and we can watch what the Google Chrome team does. But you're out there building the web. And it's up to you to help drive what the next performance benefit is for your customers. And blog it and tweet me so we can all share and learn. Now, I think I've got about five minutes left for questions. So that's it for me. I'm developer Jack. Please tweet me. Um, and I'm happy to take some questions if there are any from the floor. Do I have to auction them off? Yes. Over in the corner, we have a microphone. Awesome. Tom, you've got an auctioning. Do you want to auction off the questions? No, but I'll give you one. 
Okay. Uh, you had an example with an API there. Yep. Um, can you use this with stuff like Fetch or Ajax? Uh, how does it work with that? And if it's using a cache, can you use it with things that don't cache? Uh, can you give me an example of something you wouldn't cache? Uh, uh, APIs you don't cache, like a post or something non important. So a, a post is an outbound request. Yep. Um, arguably, you wouldn't necessarily be looking for any content back from a post other than a 200 success or a 201 created. Um, so for those sorts of requests, HTTP2 is not going to make too much difference to your performance. The APIs I'm referring to are more data retrieval and interactive um, data sources. So WebSocket still plays a, a role in giving your application an, a notification that something's changed. But it's up to your application to go and figure out if that's from messages or from notifications or from anything else. And it's those API calls uh, that you can take advantage of uh, in your app. And that's where some of the work with the cores um, service worker stuff's happening. Uh, there's a, an experiment that's in the uh, latest version of Chrome, I think it is. Um, that you can get a, a token and actually experiment with some of that cause work. There's some limitations in service workers, but you can uh, catch those transactions that, that occur in the browser. So with a get, like, say, latest post, yep. something like that, can you use this with that? Yep. And then you the get. It all comes down to the cache, and that's where service worker becomes very, very um, important to the way you structure your app. But we're also talking a lot about the first page load time. You use subsequent interactions, you know, we're kind of used to a, a new TCP connection opening. We're, we're sort of looking about the 15 that you're opening to download half the internet in order to get your web app that is now larger than the original Doom binary. It's those sorts of transactions we're talking about that has the biggest performance impact. You had a question? Yeah, hey. Um, hey. The, the, the cloud fronts of the world, the Fastly's of the world, the Akamai's of the, of the world, mm -hmm. uh, you, you demonstrated turning on HTTP2 very easily from there. Can you use that to get HTTP2 HTTP out of? That's the emoji push, right? True. Yes. Um, out of something that only supports 1.1. So say I have a stack that supports 1.1. Can I throw CloudFront in front of it and get two for free? And would it include the preload stuff if you had the links in the HTML if you were doing it that way? OK, so yes, you can use it to upgrade to 2.0. Um, the push support is going to be vendor specific. Um, I experimented with CloudFront, and it is not currently in there. I haven't had an opportunity to play with the others. I do have some semi-live pre-alpha push APIs up on a domain somewhere that we can have a poke in a pot afterwards. Um, but what you'll see is that they still pass the link headers through to the client, which means the client may be on H2, but they're still going to do those requests. Um, do we have time for one more question? One more question? Yes. Hey, um, have you done any looking into what happens when things get too fast? So, for example, what I mean is uh, there was some experiments like uh, a while back with video games with mm -hmm. the save screens, and they're actually in instantaneous, but customers misperceive them where if they're too quick, they believe nothing has happened. So, for instance, saving to a database, they might perceive that as nothing's happened or it's broken or something. Sure. If, if your app is so performant that you're in a position to add sleeps, congratulations. Because <laughs> I'd love to be in that position. Um, you're right, the customer experience is what we need to put front and center there, and that's why performance is so important. When you get down to that trust element, then you can start to run experiments to say, well, what happens if we do slow down that button? And we know Facebook does a lot of those experiments. You know, what happens if notifications just doesn't work for a day? Are they more likely to go to the web view or swap onto the, the iPhone instead of the Android? We know that um, a lot of companies run these sorts of experiments because they're in a position to do so. Um, so absolutely go for it. Let me know how you go. I think that's it. Thank you very much. Tweet me. I'll catch you later. Cool. Thank